Hello, big news from our friends over at DistroKid. They now have an app. This app works on iOS and Android, of course. And it's available in the Apple Store and Google Play Stores and all the stores where you buy apps. Go check it out. It's got a lot of cool features. You can upload new releases. You can get notified when you've earned royalties. Awesome. You can withdraw from the app via push notifications. A little dangerous for me, but rad. Anyways, go check it out. It's all at distrokid.com slash app. And don't forget, you can still get 30% off your DistroKid account by going to distrokid.com slash VIP slash tour stores. Have a great one. We would like to celebrate our friends and supporters over at isotope.com. Find makers of audio software for repair, mixing, and mastering. You know their goods. RX-10, Neutron 4, Ozone 11, Nectar 4. Chris and I love them. We use them. And we know you'll love them too. And right now, they're having a New Year's sale on many of their software bundles. Go to isotope.com and check it all out. And use code VRUIN10 when you check out to get your discount. Again, it's I-Z-O-T-O-P-E dot com. And enjoy. Hello, Tour Story listeners. Thank you for your continued support, and welcome to Season 4. I'd like to take a second to thank our friends and sponsors over at Isotope. Here at Ruinous, Chris and I rely heavily on easy-to-use tools like RX and Ozone for all of our audio repair, mixing, and mastering. Now, Tour Story listeners can get 10% off Isotope plugins or try Music Production Suite Pro for free for 30 days using code FRET10. That's F-R-E-T-1-0. To get your discount and check out all of their easy-to-use products, go to isotope.com slash ruinous. That's I-Z-O-T-O-P-E dot com slash ruinous. And use code FRET10. And thank you for listening. Hey, Andy, how you doing? I'm well, thank you, Joe. How are you doing? I'm pretty good. Where are you? I'm in Belgium. I'm in Ghent, Belgium, my new hometown, or not so new. I've been here for five years, and... Oh. Yeah, Europe for 12 years, but it's been Ghent, Belgium for the past five years. You don't say Ghent? I don't say Ghent, but recently <laughs> recently, there's Dude. been some people... Um, <laughs> who actually like say Americans even who say oh so you live in Kent and I'm like oh my gosh you you say it the right <laughs> way I don't um, <laughs> um, but yes I live in Kent or as in some parts of Belgium they say you live in Gond oh my god the other go. name for the city I guess the French the French right. yeah uh, I love that city I'm jealous that you live there it's a beautiful There's little quaint love. city isn't it yeah it's so quaint it's so pretty i think the first time i came here it was the first or second and they were for gigs and it was in the like early 2010s or whatever and one of those trips i i walked around more i ate her at a restaurant and i said to myself oh it would be a dream to live in a place like this one day and then you fast forward i don't know six or seven years and um, of course, I meet a Belgian. Of course, I fall in love. Of course, two years <laughs> later, we're living in Ghent. <laughs> we're living in like, yeah, the neighborhood that I fell in love with when I first was here playing oh my playing God. shows. Yeah, that's great. Congratulations. Yeah, you're, thank you. You're living a dream. It doesn't happen to everyone. So I have to, yeah, say thank you. I say thank you a lot, actually. Well, there's a new Hercules and Love Affair record. It's been around five years, I think, since the last one. And, of course, in that five years, we've had a pandemic. We're still kind of having one. But for some musicians, it's been a limitation. For some, it's been a, a reason to explore new things in their lives or in the world. Um, catch us up on what, what you've been doing, I guess, in the last five years-ish. Also, I'd like to... Do, what, what was the kernel for... Um, for the in amber record so you know i will say first that the pandemic was uh we all experienced it differently i think you know collectively we 
is a very interesting thing, right? We all went through something together in this really global weird way, which I've never lived through, uh, something like that. Um, perhaps wars and things like that. But, you know, this one was like, ev it was affecting everyone everywhere and uh, affected different people in different industries or different, you know, with different paths differently. Um, I ended up being very creative and slowing down like I'd never slowed down, at least for it had been like a decade since I slowed down to that degree. And um, I really relished the amount of space and room to breathe that it allowed and afforded. So um, those two years, oh gosh, it was two years. Um, I, I'd say that first year, at least where it was really uncertain and there wasn't a whole lot going on. I ended up just being really, really creative. I, I started to, I wrote tons of music remotely with artists. Um, and I started doing other things. Like I started creatively writing, like writing, like literature, creative mm. writing. I uh, yeah. started working with my hands. I, I started exploring sculpture, making jewelry, all these things, you know, you know, the people yeah. made jokes about like, oh, did you learn basket weaving over the pandemic? <laughs> but I kind of yeah, was yeah. one of those people. But um, the mixing process for In Amber took place over the pandemic, which made mixing the record a very long and much more tedious process than what would normally be a mixing process. Uh, you know, mixing a record. You sit in a room with an engineer, you ask the hi-hats to go up, it takes two minutes. Uh, yeah. I, this was like, I send an email, I say at two minutes, 12 seconds, can you please ride the hi-hat a little bit more? And then two oh emails God. later, it was done. You know what I mean? It was like, <laughs> whoa. So in Amber, the final process that mixing process and mastering process happened during the, that period. But, mm, but the okay. previous years, the kernel, I guess, um, it's a, it's an odd or unusual surprising thing for people to hear, but I've, um, for, for quite a long time, just independently on my own, or well, I say on my own, but I, I've worked on a number of like unreleased side projects with um artists in pretty intensely different genres namely my younger brother who happens to be a death metal singer oh. in a yeah in a really cool band called vastum so he and his the guitarist leila abdul raouf uh she's also the vocalist in the, that death metal band um she and i she he and i and a guy called mark pistol who toured with me extensively from a band called Consolidated uh, and me, he was with Meet Meet Manifesto. We were working on these industrial, very heavy, very heavy industrial kind of metal sounding songs. Yeah. yeah. And so that started 10 years ago. Um, none of it's been released, of course. It's just been this ongoing, you know, crazy project. But I've been exploring heavier sounds and... I don't know. There came a moment where I, I just was like, I want to hit it heavy again. I want to experiment. I want to make these synthesizers growl as loud as they can. I want, I want to evoke the sound of a guitar with a little, with a synth. I want to overdrive it. I want to, I want to make the sound of a rhythm guitarist, but on a little Korg toy, you know? And, um, yeah, the exploration, the kernel, I think, I guess is that. And then, Initially, I was sort of thinking again, like, do I veer into maybe working on with it with a metal vocalist? There was a a singer from a kind of I don't know post black metal band called Oathbreaker who was around, and um, we started experimenting. And at one point, I sent Anoni some demos just for fun, like to get opinions. Mm -hmm. And um, she wrote back like, "These are cool. Let's do something." <laughs> And I was like, I, I, I didn't, I didn't respond. I didn't know how to, I was like, all right, is she serious? I don't know. Maybe she's just being <laughs> nice or whatever. And uh, then I sent another and she was like, we should do something over these. And um, it's not surprising as, you know, her music and her history or with music, her love of, of music is like, it's, it extends into some, a very dark punk kind of um she grew up in California in a kind of death rock scene. Yeah. So she had this like response to it. Right. And that was the kernel. That was the kernel. We got together and it 
it started from there. We started just exploring. Well, it's uh, well. First, I I want to say in amber is a beautiful dark journey, and I I, I this is Thank my kind you. of journey. It's really great. Um, and I want to talk a little bit more about how you made the record and the, and the personnel involved. But first, um, there's a lot of lyrically and and sort of the the message from the record is a there's a lot of religious rejection abuse caused by societal constructs even religious constructs and another interesting thing that that i'm getting from the record is that you kind of address the not just on people this sort of destruction and uh oppression but also like kind of suggesting on earth and biology and and i i see it as all because of these false narratives um that again are are presented in in our cultures due to societal constructs that are just fucked basically and <laughs> um and given that we you you ad- i feel like you you're addressing and that's kind of you know that's not necessarily it's not happy stuff but it's for me it's very interesting the other side of it is that on the song 1 you're addressing violence and um discrimination and things like that but it, there's also this message of perseverance and, and maybe even strength. Um, yeah. Given all all of that, is there a message th- that you could say is is coming from in amber? Is there one kind of single message that's coming from in amber? That's a really hard one. I don't. I, I and I can't say that there is really. Uh, yeah. You know, it's uh, as as a musician, you know how like sometimes you write twenty songs and like. 10 end up on the record or maybe write 40 songs and like 12 end up on the record or whatever. And, um, this was the case on some level, like the journey went further and, um, there were other places we explored, but, um, I guess when it came down to the interplay of these 12 songs, it felt like there was, there was a story or there was some through line, you know, and, you know, there is a, an acknowledgement for sure of the, sort of imposed societally constructed and uh on some level quite damaging concepts that organized religions have put forward and imposed upon people you know often queer people indigenous people you know like there's been a lot of uh let's say rot if you will uh and um on the other hand you know I, I would say in Amber exists, this record exists kind of in extremes, you know, sonically it exists in, in extremes, mm-hmm. but then there's also a sort of um, almost messaging wise, there's an, there's extremity because, you know, I wanted to also incorporate and re- reflect on and acknowledge a sort of um, the possibility of finding peace and finding a sense of your purpose and acknowledging that, you know, um, accessing the divine is possible right here, right now in yeah. this body, in this physical form, okay. you know? And, um, it's kind of speaks to what you're saying. It's like this disconnection to nature or the organic that, that is truly preached in some, you know, especially Abrahamic religions where there's this notion of dominion over nature or yeah. the, this, you know, there's this, so the subjugation of nature and thereby also, the subjugation of, of of women or all of these you know things like this and it's it's not to say on some level that to, to cast aside all search for meaning and all search for the spiritual because i think that the record on some level also is very pointedly speaking to uh recognizing your indestruct like one's indestructible value outside okay. of the need to be acknowledged by some higher you know white dude with a big beard sitting on a throne who's gonna yeah. you know ultimately yeah. judge you you know so um it's much more about the here and now in terms of like where the spiritual experience can happen and is happening and um yeah i i think that might be the dialogue on the record if there is one you know yeah. if there's a i don't know if there's a singular message but there's there's that dialogue taking place okay. and um yeah well, I I do want to talk a little bit more about the record, but first, I think what what best illustrates um what you just said is this song Poisonous Storytelling. Is it cool if I play that one? 
I would love it. All right, here it goes.
amazing tune, man. Uh, I have Thank to you. point out point out first because I'm a drummer is Budgie's on the record. Huh. Um, he's a big influence both both consciously and unconsciously for me. Um, and the other thing about having him on the record and mixed with the program drums or electronic drums is sometimes those two people try to do that and they take away from each other. And I think yeah. on an Amber, they're blended really perfectly and they give each other power. And I love the record as a whole, but give me this record with just the drums and I'll listen yeah, to absolutely. that just, just this much. It's, Man, it's you, really but- great. You you definitely hit the nail on the head. I mean, this is one of the hardest things I feel like. And it's been something I've sort of been doing from the beginning with like, you know, like incorporating on dance music, live drums, infusing them with electronic sound yeah. and electronic drums. It, it can be real tricky business. Uh, but um, in this instance, it's a much more straight, like, I, I use the word straightforward budgie is anything but straightforward, but like there's a more like, you know, rock, if you will, approach to the drumming, which was like, okay, we're going to have to fuse this, you know, overhead mics of like pummeling toms mm-hmm. with like, um, you know, maybe a 909 kick drum. Like what's mm-hmm. going to, what's going to happen here, you know? And, yeah. um, that, that recipe right there doesn't sound too hard, but, um, <laughs> You know, as you get into it, it's like when you start to talk about snares, synthetic snares, mixing with live snares and like it's tricky. It's, it's tricky stuff. Um, that's why I was really lucky to go to uh, the mix engineer that I did, which was David Wrench, who um, David has worked on the XX, FKA Twigs, a lot of that Young Turk stuff. And oh, okay. um, yeah, and... David's like an instrumentalist that's played in lots of both band bands, but then also done a lot of electronics. And I felt pretty confident in his abilities to make that stuff happen. But I will also say that like the moment drums entered into the picture, the whole story changed. I mean, the moment Budgie started playing, for instance, on Poisonous Storytelling, it was yeah. like the the whole the whole control room lit up engineers me we were all like whoa whoa we were listening to something and now we're listening to something else you know and um yeah it's a it's incredible how much life was injected into the record because of his contributions because of his his you know participation so um yeah tricky business but i'm very grateful that i that I went into that tricky business because yeah. it added so much, you know. Yeah, and it really worked. Like no bullshit worked. Like it. I, Thank I, you. I, I, I scientifically delved into some of those sounds where it's like, well, what are the, you know, like I'm not a super tech engineer or anything, but the one thing about reverb with acoustic drums versus sticking a reverb on an electronic sound or drum. They respond differently, and you can sometimes hear them, and that doesn't work. You know, totally they, they make each other stick out. Absolutely. Uh, so, anyways, fucking killer. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, there's also you reference a lot of uh, different genres, some European folk, ancient European folk music. I'd almost say, and um, of course, house and some industrial. Uh, on that song, Disassociation, I kind of hear, in the same way that like trip-hop used to approach dub and reggae, man, I really hear that. I feel that in that song. Mm-hmm. Again, it's it's just like the drums. It's really it's really tied together. It's not like, here's your dance song, and here, you know, it, it works really well. It, wh- Thank what you. is the glue? Is it with the production on that, or, or tonal? Well, that one's that song in in particular. I think it's uh you you nailed that you nailed that too. I mean, like the truth of the matter is, when I started Hercules, there was a there were a handful of artists that I kind of looked to almost as a model conceptually, like, but also sonically bands that moved me, you know. And um, you know, it's undeniable for me that Massive Attack was something of an influence for me. Um, I, I heard Blue Lines as a kid when I was 15 and it kind of was one of the life-changing records for me. And, and you know, you, you saw in their journey, you know, 
how they incorporated live drums into a yeah. sort of to more electronic atmospheres, really moody electronic atmospheres. Right. So um, there was in some way, I think, production wise, an aspect of dissociation where I was like, if it goes there, I'm happy, you know, cool. You know, um, on that song in particular, I asked Budgie to feel as free and loose, almost like akin to a jazz drummer mm -hmm. um, in the studio and uh, just play. I was like, just play around. Don't like, like hit the rim, hit the snare, use the brush, do the this, do the that. Like avoid, avoid things, incorporate things, like play less, play more, do it. You know, it was really a free, like free kind of way of playing. And um, I also think something that helped kind of in general helped maybe with glue, that glue that you're talking about was that I started to use really ambient sounding synthetic drums. So mm -hmm. you would hear something that sounded like um, a boom or a very like muted explosion. And that would, that would act as kind of like a kick drum instead of feeling like a straightforward kick drum. You would hear percussive sounds that were sort of manipulated and muted or and really drenched in reverb, things like this. So all of those things, I think, afforded uh, a bit of that blend, if you will. Yeah. You know. All right. Well, um, of course, Anani and Budgie are on the record. What's the other personnel on this? So um, there's an Icelandic singer who I worked with on my fourth album called Aelin A. And... Um, yeah, she's coming from a very, in some ways, traditional Icelandic music background. Um, both of her parents are musicians. Um, her father is actually a really virtuosic and successful jazz fusion artist. And then mother is um, an incredible singer who has recorded um, many a traditional piece of Icelandic folk music and they experienced quite a bit of success in, especially in Iceland, they're quite known. Mm -hmm. So she and her sisters grew up just singing together. Every one of the f members of the family are incredibly musical. And she and I, she's someone I wrote a lot of music with over the pandemic. We have this incredible ease with which uh, th that just happens in collaboration. I love writing with her. On strings in general, but we're talking guitars, we're talking, there was an oud that was played at one point. Oh, right. Violins, um, cello violin. Uh, it's kind of another super virtuosic, beautiful, beautiful person here in, in Ghent, Belgium called Reinhard van Bergen. He's classically trained and everything, but he's... Um, He's a dance music head as much as he is mm -hmm. everything else. So yeah. he's got a really fun side project called the Rheinsand with his partner, Charlotte Caruer, who also is in the live uh, touring band playing keys and stuff. I had a guitarist actually from that band, Oathbreaker, playing like tremolo guitar over Christian prayers. So I wanted a sort of yeah. black metal texture on one sure. of the songs. So he plays and... That that's kind of the core. Yeah, and did you and did you um let's see, you mixed over pandemic for the most part. So the recording was not remote. Some of it was. Some of the recording was remote, but no like Budgie was every time together. Mm -hmm. Anoni only like once or twice was remote and neither of us liked that. And then yeah. um Aelin was remote. And then okay. obviously the other folks live in Ghent, so I was with them. Well, um, thanks to all of those people right, and, all, and you for getting it. It's a really beautiful record. Thank you. Do you have plans to tour? We do. We're already sort of, um, well, we've had our first show. Um, it's a, it's interesting. It's, um, it's like the first time I went on the road with the first album, I had, I don't know, God, six, seven people, brass section, you know, live drummer, all this stuff. And then I was like, whoa. A lot of people, a lot of personalities. <laughs> um, and uh, then it, it sort of like over the years became more and more. But this is also because of my interest in sort of more direct house and techno music. It became more sure. and more electronic. And now with this record, it was like, we're going back. We're bringing live drums on stage. Budgie's playing drums with us. Um, Aelin 
is singing. Crystal Warren, a tremendous vocalist who sang on my third record. She's just an um, unbelievable singer. So she's touring with us and then Reinhardt and Charlotte and myself. So it's a kind of a big, big production. All right. When's it starting? So this weekend, <laughs> we, oh, have two, <laughs> we have two days of rehearsals now. We have a show in Antwerp on Friday. Then we go to Finland on Saturday. And then um, then there's a lull, but it then picks up in the midst of summer and continues through fall. In terms of live dates in the States, it is, it's uncertain, but um, I'm not sure, you know, touring the States is kind of it's hard business. Like it is, you know, um, I'm a little older and getting in the tour bus and hitting all of those smaller cities as much as I would love to. It's really a kind of a costly and uh grueling affair. So yeah. we'll probably, you know, we'll probably hit some quote unquote capital cities. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, we'll definitely be there. Okay. Well, maybe I'll just have to go to Europe. I maybe. miss Europe. I haven't been in two years. But so I hope to, to see some version of it live. Yeah, we'll get there. All right, I'll encourage it over here. I'll flyer. I'll be your street team. <laughs> that would be. Yeah. <laughs> I'll flyer for know, no I, shows, a campaign. <laughs> <laughs> You'll hit the streets. We'll be putting up posters. That would be, I mean, I, I really, the, I hope the record resonates enough to get some momentum and some, you know, some so cool bookings over there. Me too. All right, well, when you do get traveling, please travel safe. And Thank you. again, congratulations to you and everyone on this record. It's it's killer. And Thank you so I much. I hope I get to see it. The only other thing I'll say is I will be DJing in the States. Hopefully, hopefully. It looks like maybe with Soft Cell in August. Oh, really? So, yeah. So, oh, nice. Um, I'll be over stateside doing some of that okay. kind of stuff. But At least come to Seattle. Yeah. I mean, it's been too long since I've been there. I love it there. Yeah, you know? come on over. There's no sun. No sun to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> All right, take Thank care you. of yourself. And again, it was it was nice talking to you. Thank Lovely you. Lovely talking to you. Thanks, Joe. Bye. 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 Dissociation. My eyes can't focus. I can't see if you're here. Floating with me. Nothing means much to me What do you make of it all? Dissociation Affecting us all Back and forth, I'm rocking Glassy eyes, no talking Back and forth, I'm rocking Glassy eyes, no talking Thank you.